Excellent. Welcome to the Minus Point Team demo meeting, everyone. I uh, appreciate that everybody could join us today. Got some good stuff to cover this week and a good handful of demos with Alan Foster from our framework development team taking us through the framework bits, which is super. So let's hop in. Everybody loves talking about Metasploit Framework. Um, so I will virtually hand the mic over to Alan Foster uh, to talk us through the framework bits. Alan? Thanks, Chris. Awesome. Let's jump into new modules. Um, Awesome. So community member Gavin Euchre has added a new SU login module, which facilitates the upload and execution of a payload on Linux targets as another user, which is awesome. Uh, our very own Will Vu has added a new SharePoint server-side include module, which gains RC against SharePoint targets vulnerable to CV 2020 16.952. And with an additional thanks to Stephen Seeley for his original advisory and exploit proof of concept. Uh, our very own Spencer McIntyre has added a new module for Telerik UISP.NET Ajax um, to gain RCE against vulnerable targets. And community member Tim Wright has contributed a module for Wizard Opium Chrome LPE, and we'll have a demo of this later. For enhancements and features, um, community member Justin, Justin Stephen discovered and contributed a fix for a client-side command injection issue within MSF Venom's handling of malicious APK template. So thank you for looking into that. And community member Hoodie has contributed documentation and code quality changes to multiple Windows post modules. Always appreciate it. And our very own Christopher Granlis has contributed tab completion for specifying inline options when using the run command. And we'll see a demo of this later. And community member Husky Hacks has updated the enum putty saved sessions module to additionally gather the proxy username and proxy password. We'll also have a demo of this. And for bug fixes, um, our very own Spencer McIntyre fixed a regression issue within the MS1710 Eternal Blue module uh, that was preventing sessions from being successfully obtained. So thank you. And community member Justin Stephen fixed a regression issue within PHP Interpreter. Uh, and he did that so by converting some of the missed TLV command IDs uh, being changed from strings to integers. So thanks for that. And the MS1710 PS exact and PS exact modules have been updated with additional validation to ensure that the service stub option is actually a valid encoder. Previously, the invalid option would just be silently ignored. Uh, so that's a bit of a usability improvement. And community member Justin Stephen has also fixed several broken modules, seven broken, broken links within the contributors markdown file. And our very own Adam Kamek has improved the RPC endpoint for the compatible sessions implementation to additionally support exploits as well as existing post module support. And community member Gustav Blomkvist contributed a fix for the BPF sign extension privesc module to ensure that the UID field within the cred strut is the correct size. Thank you for that. And for bug fixes, our very own Grant Wilcox improved the module output for the enum DNS auxiliary module. I believe there are some prefix and trailing characters which have been fixed, so thank you for that. And our very own Jeffrey Martin has improved the error handling for some of our HTTP scanner login modules to also include the error scenario of catching SSL errors. And as always, uh, thank you to everyone that has made Metasploit better through contributions to the project. So big thank you to you. And for details on recent framework activity, you can always check the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog posts at blog.rabbit7.com. Awesome. So jumping in straight into demos, uh, our first demo is from Grant, and he's going to show us some more descriptive external module error logging. Yeah, so this module came from, uh, or I shouldn't say it was module more of enhancement, came from Hoodie, um, one of our contributors. So if you just want to play the video, basically what, it, I'm hoping the text is large enough to read. Um, but basically what I'm trying to show here is that 
previously, if you had a module where it was marked as executable, or rather it wasn't marked as executable, um, and then you tried to load it, it would just silently fail. It wouldn't actually tell you the reason why it couldn't load it. Um, so we're just going to do a couple of tests here. Um, we will cut the video a bit short, uh, just because towards the end of it, there was a little bit of confusion, but we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, for now, basically what I'm trying to do is just mark it, mark this particular module as not being executable, and then also fix, just change a little bit of the import um, as well, just to make it so that it would be a case of the module not working because we can't load a particular library and also because it's not marked as executable. So right now I'm just starting off MSF console. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at the framework log file. Um, and it may be a bit hard to read, but basically what it's saying is that the module um, is not marked as executable and therefore we can't actually load the module into the framework. Um, there's also an additional error where if we do end up fixing that, so I'm just going to go ahead and mark this. Uh, sorry, just give it a few secs. Um, yes, yeah, so, so this is just pointing out again that the module's not marked as executable. So yeah, now I'm going to go back and mark the module as executable again. And now if we try run NSF console, we should get a different error, which is basically that a warning saying, hey, you know, have you actually checked to see? Um, yeah, so this will just basically say, hey, you know, we can't actually load the module. Have you checked to see if there's a dependency error or if you haven't loaded in a required library? So that's pretty much it for this. You can just pause, pause the video. That's great. Uh, any questions on that? L less so of a question, but more of a statement. Uh, MSF console also has an inbuilt log command, L-O-G, uh, which will also show you the log file that you were just demonstrating. Uh, I believe that was contributed by will do. Um, so that's a useful command as well for debugging these kinds of uh, custom modules. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Grant. And another demo from Grant to showcase the potty changes to additionally store the proxy name and proxy password fields. Yeah, so this contribution comes from hacks, Pussy Hacks. Um, and basically what happened was before when we tried to dump um, some of the information, we weren't necessarily getting the proxy, say proxy credentials. So if you just want to play the video here. Um, so basically what I'm going to do, go ahead and do is, this is the latest version of Putty. I'm just going to go ahead and set up a sample session here where we're just getting um, we're going to place in a couple of details. So we're not actually going to connect to anything. We're just going to save a session to say, hey, you know, potentially there could be like a session on the system where we set the proxy uh, username and password. So I'm just going to set it to test and test here. Um, and then we're going to go back over to our session information and we're going to save it with the, a sample session name. So that's really all we're going to do for regards to setup. You can see if we just go ahead and verify this and reload it and go back into the proxy information, we can see that we saved the username and password as session. So if we go back over to our Mouseploit instance, we're now going to run the updated version. You can see that I've got a shell here. Basic permissions, uh, nothing too special. It's just a normal user um, running on Windows 10. So what this module will now do is we'll now also check for additional keys um, corresponding to the saved proxy username and password. So I'm just going to go ahead and load up the module here. Um, 
Ford wasn't actually checking for these keys. So potentially what you could do is run the module and it wouldn't grab this information. It would just say, hey, we don't have any session information available. Um, whereas now we'll actually dump them out to a file. So I'm just going to run this quickly. And you can see we get the username and password. Um, now, the one thing I will say about this module, and this is a future area of improvement that we could do, is it doesn't actually save it to the credentials database right now. Um, you'll see that in a few moments, but it does actually save it as a note. Um, so you can still get the information that way, or you can get it from the output of the file. So we're just gonna double check that. You can see it's in the correct format. And that's pretty much it for that demo. Anyone have any questions? That's great. Uh, thanks, Grant. And for our next demo uh, is by Chris, uh, who will show us the tab completion functionality of inline options in conjunction with the run command. Yeah, so just maybe a brief overview before we actually start the video here. Um, so this enhancement adds tab completion for the options when using the run command or an alias command for that module type. So an example of that might be if you're using exploit, you can use either the run command or the exploit command. Uh, so for an example, just before we go in, if you're an MSF console and you're currently using an exploit, type in run and then hitting the tab key twice will display a list of all the generated options. Um, another thing is that if it's an incomplete option, so let's say you have, uh, if you do run and then R and then hit tab tab, that will also bring just up obviously uh, the same list only filtered down by the first letter being R. So just turn everything with R there. Uh, also, this enhancement is available across the following module types. It's going to be available on auxiliary, evasion, exploit, payload, and post. So uh, if you could play the video there, and we'll just go through the demo. OK, so in this situation, again, we're just using an exploit. So we're just doing run here, tab, tab. As you can see, that brings up your full list, uh, including flags and option names. Uh, if you use dash there, obviously, you can filter down to just your flags for the tab completion. Yeah, so in this situation here, we have tab completed the option name. And then if you tab tab again, it'll bring up the corresponding option values uh, for the actual thing. So for both there, we had both uh, true and false. And then again, if you do tab tab after you have your first option set, it will bring up another list of what's uh, available. In that situation there, we were using LHOST. And again, we get as far as equals if you tab tab, it'll bring up all of the possible option values for that. Uh, option name in this situation, obviously, as we said, being Ellos. And that's that. Uh, any questions? Most convenient. <laughs> Not really a question, I guess. <laughs> that's great. Thanks, Chris. I'm pretty sure a lot of users may not even be aware of the ability to specify inline options. So hopefully this at the very least makes it more discoverable. And then once it is discovered, we'll make it a lot more convenient than using the set L host sort of approach or workflow that's currently being used. Um, awesome. Thank you, Chris. And jumping back to another demo from Grant uh, to do with the Chrome Sandbox Escape, AKA Wizard Opium. Yeah, so this PR is from uh, Hoodie. Um, just to give a little bit of context on this, um, the Chrome exploit that we're demoing here is not necessarily new. Um, it's already been in the framework. We're just expanding it to add support for the Hoodie wizard opium exploit. Um, now, this does have some interesting consequences, which we'll demonstrate in the video. So if you just want to play this so long. Um, for those who don't know, the wizard opium attack was originally used in combination with the Chrome exploit. So this does sort of mimic a real world situation that was encountered by Google, where they had a Chrome zero day that was being used with wizard opium as well to gain the local privileges. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and set up a couple of things here. Um, we did send the exploit target to one, so they will actually run the sandbox escape. Currently, the sandbox escape only works on Windows 7. Uh, we 
have tried to get it to work on other systems, but it hasn't been reliable. Um, so currently, the module only supports Windows 7 for sandbox escaping. Um, we're then going to go ahead and just set the rest of the options, so the service hopes, et cetera. Uh, just double checking a few of the options here and going ahead and setting them appropriately. Yeah, so the one option that there is there is a debug exploit. Uh, you don't have to specify that, but it is useful just to see what's going on behind the scenes a little bit more. So here we're going to go over to a vulnerable version of the Google uh, Chrome browser. And we're just going to go ahead and browse to this URL, um, which is host in our exploit. So I'm just going to go ahead and type that in there. Just correct the URL a little bit because I'm typing in correctly. And as you can see, um, we just the page is loading, and on the other side, we're getting the whole Chrome exploit working. Um, the Chrome exploit will first go ahead and exploit the just if you just want to pause the video for two secs. Um, so the Chrome exploit basically what happens here, um, it's a little hard to see because there's a bunch of stuff going on, but there'll be a just-in-time bug within the Chrome browser. Um, now that alone with the sandbox, which is default on Chrome, Google Chrome, does not actually allow you to really interact with the system very much. Uh, you're still confined to the Chrome sandbox. If we then use the wizard opium exploit, we can actually escape out of that sandbox and get a full system session. So if you want to just continue the video, you can see that we're actually running as NT authority system. So we have complete control over the system and we run essentially as the kernel. So we've gone from a user just browsing to a website to now full control over their system as the system user. So we can verify that. Uh, you can see the permissions are what we would expect for system user and the UID is also the system user. And if we want to further verify this, we can also load up QE and just verify that we can actually run the stuff we would expect as the system user. So here we're done the user's password and we can also see that we're running this system. So that's just another way to verify that. Anyone have any questions? Also, uh, also one last point that I wanted to point out, um, you can close down the Chrome session. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Um, but most of the time, the only problem that we've had with this exploit is that it will sometimes blue screen when the user sh shuts down their session. Um, otherwise, for the most part, it's a very stable exploit. Yeah, good to know. Neat. It's a cool demo. Awesome. Any further questions? Thank you, Grant. That was cool. Thanks, and thank you, Alan. I no, appreciate that. We'll uh, continue on um, into our attacker KB or the attacker knowledge base. Uh, you know, hacker data at community scale. Uh, you can learn about and discuss which phones matter and why at attackerkb.com. Got some exciting news to share this week, uh, but I will let um, James Barnett share it. Um, yeah, so uh, the big news is that Attacker KB is now 1.0 GA, um, I don't know, whatever name you want to call it. Uh, we removed the beta tag from the, uh, from the logo, so um, what does this mean? Uh, basically, it means that um, we, we consider it, it's it pretty stable and it's got enough features to uh, you know, be called a, a real product. Um, as far as like... Uh, changes and stuff like we'll probably start promoting it more um we've uh, we'll start tweeting um from our official attacker kb twitter account and also um we've been doing 
we're going to start doing some uh, experiments with like Google ads and, and trying to bring uh, just more attention to the site in that way. Um, as far as like new features and stuff, we, we added a ton of little features over the last uh, month that um, I'm going to go over here in the demo, but uh, you know, it's been a lot of work from the team. Everybody's really busted their ass to, to get it to this point. And I think we've got a, a pretty good, um, pretty good tool for the security community uh, as a result. Um, we're definitely gonna keep working on it. It's not like this means that, that you know, it's just going into maintenance mode or anything. It's more just, um, you know, we, we kind of considered this an internal milestone and uh, it's something that we can advertise the community. And also, you know, it's, it's, it's like kind of the next step. It's like, how do we increase usage? How do we, um, you know, fine tune things and stuff. So, um, yeah, it should be uh, more stable. It should be um, a little bit more feature complete, but by no means are we done. So, uh, yeah, I'll just go over some of the changes that were added in the last month. Um, these are documented in the change log, but it's just like a lot of little things. So um, I wanted to bring attention to them. Um, so uh, one of the first things is, uh, can you see my smaller window with the email? Yeah. Okay, cool. So we added this footer to uh, emails, all the emails that are sent from Attacker KB. Um, it accomplishes a few things. Um, this line right here will tell you the username that it was intended to be sent to. This is to hopefully help uh, reduce uh, phishing attempts because you know, if this line isn't present in your Attacker KB email, then it probably wasn't sent by us. Um, this, uh, we also now tell you where, what setting is tied to this particular notification. So that way, when you go into your uh, preferences on your profile page, um, you know exactly what to toggle if you don't want to receive those notifications anymore. Um, and then also we added the rapid summon address because that's just a compliance thing for uh, you know, sending emails. So um, that's one small update. I uh, expect more updates to this in the near future. Um, we're we're going to be adding like a new uh, unsubscribe page and stuff. Um, the next thing is that we version the API. Um, so the API has been available since close to launch, uh, but we've always just had it at uh, you know slash or at API at attackerkp.com slash endpoint. Uh, we now have this slash v1 in all of the endpoints. So all of these are also um, at slash v1. And uh, everything in this version of the um, uh, API will be non-breaking. So you can continue to use this, this version and expect that your apps won't break. We'll continue adding stuff that's non-breaking to it. But if we need to make changes that are breaking, then we'll add like a slash v2 API URL and, you know, start making those breaking changes there. Um, we had a couple times in during beta where we, you know, pushed stuff up that, that broke the current functionality. So um, this is, this will give you a little bit more reinsurance that you don't have to, uh, you know, like that your app's not going to just break overnight. Um, what else? Okay, so this one I have in my local because I didn't want a new topic on um, prod, but uh, so now when you add a new topic, um, you will now be taken to, so what we did when we uh, changed the location of the uh, references for topics is we removed them from the create topic uh, view, or sorry, new topic uh, form and um, we moved it out to the vulnerability details tab, but that also removed the ability to like add important information like a CVE or um, you know other references while you're creating the topic. So now you can create the topic as normal, but um, when you click submit, it will take you to it will just automatically pop up the add references form to kind of remind you like, hey, this this works best if you add a CVE. Um, so that way, we, uh, both people in the community and like our internal tools can identify the, the topic. Um, so the, the important part is the name the, or the description. So you want to make sure you have your CVE here. So it says CVE 2029. You need to have a URL. Usually you put in like cve.miter.org. Uh, I can't remember the full thing. It's like CVE. And then make sure you select it as canonical, and that's how it'll be. Um, how it'll be. No, how our tools know to 
mark this as an identifier for the um, for the specific topic. Uh, and then, you know, just you can click uh, add reference and it'll show up right there. Um, and then you can add more as needed. But yeah, now the new topic form will take you directly to the add references form as a reminder to add references if they're available. Um, oh, this one's really cool. This is added by uh, Jorge Huerta. Um, you can now watch topics on the homepage. Uh, so you can just, you know, toggle things here. And and uh, just watch or unwatch topics from the homepage. So that's all. Um, it's just a lot more convenient than clicking into the individual topic and then uh, clicking out. You can also do this on the search page. Um, oh, uh, the. Uh, uh, value bars for the attacker value have been updated. Um, it's kind of a subtle change, but I think it makes it a little bit more readable. Um, just like the the kind of like dual tone style has been um, improved and they've been spread out a little bit and the heights increased a little bit. It just makes it a little bit easier to parse the data from a distance or quickly. Um, and the last thing is actually another demo that rep, uh, that Matthew Aquino is going to show off. So um, yeah, we're super excited to be out of beta. Um, we hit a milestone in September. We had 25,000 unique users visit the site. Um, we're hoping to keep that number going up and to the right. So uh, you know, always looking for more feedback and um, suggestions on how we can make the site better, and uh, you know, just just keep making a valuable tool for the community. Uh, we've got um, a demo uh, from Matthew who's going to show off the, the new Rapid7 analysis search filter. Okay, so uh, this has actually been live for a little while, but we want to draw attention to it. Um, let's say search for buffer overflow, something like buffer overflow. I'm curious what's out there. We get our results. And, but I'm actually really interested in recent buffer overflows that have rapid seven analysis. We got a collection of folks at rapid seven writing really detailed analysis of uh, various vulnerabilities and those get published. You may have seen uh, notifications either in app or email for those. Uh, but here's a, a new way for you to explore it maybe you're curious about what's been written in the past, or you're trying to dive down some filters and look for something from this year or with a certain attack vector, et cetera. Uh, here, I'm just going to narrow the scope of my buffer overflow search by those which have rapid seven analysis available. And we see that there are five currently available. And it's just a, it's just a quick demo of that, but it's a new way to explore the attacker KB data set. Uh, from the perspective of uh, those which have rapid seven analysis available. And uh, we hope you enjoy the value that those bring and also this new way to sort of explore data. That's all. Yeah, that's super handy, Matthew. Uh, thank you for for showing that off, um, make it easy for folks to surface those uh, those analysis write-ups that are really detailed and good. To dovetail onto what James was saying um, about the the attacker KB um, GA, that's huge. Uh, the team really did push hard and um, did a lot of great work, um, and it it shows. Uh, so yeah, definitely a lot of excitement around being able to pull the beta label off there, and uh, and great job to the team on that. And uh, I think that's going to call it. In the meantime, everybody have a, a safe week and take care. Excellent.